I can't help but find some amusement when I started the gospel today that I immediately worried not having the right text before me, and I thought to myself, dear God, did I prepare a sermon on the wrong gospel text? But fortunately, thank you for bringing up the text to me today. How many of you are worriers? Oh, come now. How many of you find yourselves anxious or worrying quite a bit of the time? Come on, yes, we admit it. I'll be honest to you, worrying is probably a virtue in my world. I've seen to perfected the art of worry. And I have to tell you, I take great annoyance, or I'm terribly annoyed, when overly pious people tell me, don't worry, God will provide. It often gets to me in a way that I can hardly describe. Because on the one hand, it seems like a terrible platitude, something that we just simply say to people to make them feel good. And in another way, it also seems like this temptation to simply dismiss or dis diminish the real anxieties of life. And I often want to respond to people when they say this to me, I want to say, bugger off. <laughs> Sorry for being so crude, but it is annoying. <laughs> Thus, when I get to a gospel such as the one we have today, I get annoyed. This is not the Jesus I necessarily like to hear from today. It's so much easier to worry and to be anxious. And let's face it, a lot of people do have numerous things to be anxious about. I know many of you in this room deal with some very substantial concerns in your life. And let's face it, the people of Jesus' time, we're dealing with extraordinary difficulties in ways that I don't think you and I could ever possibly imagine or conceive of. For one thing, they were dealing with an extraordinary oppression, an oppressive regime, the Roman regime, was, which was prohibiting the people from flourishing. Scholars even suggest that their economic poverty was nothing like that of which we know today. And it is clear from the accounts of the time that people were desperate for some sign of hope, for life, for they flocked around Jesus. Yet he gets up to them and says, don't worry. Trust God in all things. I don't think Jesus was necessarily trying to diminish or dismiss the real anxieties of people's lives at that time. In fact, if anything, if you read in other parts of the Gospels, it's clear Jesus gets terribly moved by what the people are going through. There's numerous moments, and they're quite touching. In fact, in Matthew himself, he says this, where Jesus actually weeps upon seeing the struggles of the people. But I think Jesus here for this moment is trying to help people to step away from the anxieties of everyday life and to pause. Now, it would help to know the scene in which Jesus is giving this sermon. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount, that famous sermon in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus has a series of sayings, most famous of which is the Beatitudes. 
But it's believed, at least in Matthew's account, it's believed that Jesus is standing up way on top of a mountain and that people are gathered around him and he can see all around him. And it's suspected that he's giving this sermon roughly during the springtime in a land that's typically rather arid, but at this moment likely had all these flowers that were blooming, wildflowers that were blooming in the field. Now, the English translation will call them lilies. They were likely not lilies in the way that you and I imagine them. They were a sort of a poppy. Some call them Spanish marigolds. They're quite popular in the Mediterranean areas. But from what scholars know is that these flowers, they just flourished abundantly in a land that was typically quite arid and a land that didn't necessarily lend itself to such extraordinary beauty. And it seems to me what Jesus is trying to do with his disciples, with all the crowds that are gathered around him, is he's trying to invite them just for a moment to step away from the anxieties of life. He's not trying to diminish them by saying, do not worry. He's not trying to say, oh, forget your problems. Jesus knows the problems are real. And he tells his disciples that we have a job to care for one another and to support one another. Here, though, I think he's inviting the crowds to step away just for a moment and to open their eyes and to see. See, the thing about worry and anxiety, and I speak to you from personal experience, the thing about worry and anxiety is that it often leads us to get very narrow focused. We begin to look so very carefully at the problems that we have and those problems become so extraordinarily great to the point that they overwhelm us and they cloud our vision, they block our ability to see the world at large. And if we don't stop, this can lead to despair for we lose sight of the life that is around us. Now this is a real problem that all of us go through at some point in our life. And I think we have to extend to ourselves and to others extraordinary compassion in these moments. But Jesus is taking the people in an exercise in which he's saying, I invite you to step back, to look, and to see the world around you. For a moment, try not to focus in on your anxiety and fear, but look around you. And as he does, he points out to these thousands of flowers which were spectacular in color. Apparently, if you go to the Middle East or to particularly Israel in the spring, it's quite moving when you see in the countryside sort of like our spring. You know how our springs are so wonderful when all the flowers come up about? And he's saying, take a look at this. Look at the extraordinary beauty that surrounds you. Look at what God has fashioned and formed. Pay attention to the birds of the sky, the animals of the field. Look at all these living creatures which are in abundance. That's what God wishes for you. That's what God wishes for you. And by doing this, he takes the disciples, and I think he takes us, and has us simply step back and to become more grateful for the world in which we find ourselves. To appreciate the goodness and beauty that surrounds us, not only in creation, but in one another. And I think he does another thing too as well, and that is to illustrate that all things in creation are interconnected. All things are related. And if we 
intend to survive or endure these difficult times, we need to depend upon one another, not to go into isolation, but again to open our vision and our hearts to relate with others. Because the danger about worry and anxiety is it allows us to become very self-focused. And it prohibits us from actually seeing possibility. And God is saying, look. Look what's so possible around you. These plants are living in just as harsh condition as you are. Yet there is life. And they don't survive on their own. They depend upon all other living creatures as well to sustain them. So do you. But most of all, they find their life in the God of life. They root themselves in that God, trusting and knowing that that God will guide and lead. It may not be evident. It may not be apparent. But in time, that God will lead. As the harvest season begins to close, this is a time for us to take pause and to give thanks for the abundance that surrounds us. But to also pause and acknowledge the hand of God that's working within all of this. And to open our vision and our hearts to see an abundance that's forming around us. And that no matter how difficult things may be, and I'm not trying to give a nice platitude, I'm not trying to say that your life isn't going to be filled with difficulties or challenges, but rather to imagine that life will emerge even out of the ruins of death, Eden, even out of the problems. I'm reminded of two days after the church fire as we were all crushed and devastated by this extraordinary loss that during the vigil, so many of us took note of the abundance of birds that were flying in and out of the ruin. That to me pointed to this fact that death does not have the final say. Pain and suffering are not the end. But life will emerge and bloom and blossom from this. But for us to see, we have to open our eyes and to look. If we become anxious, if we become concerned, if we allow the trials of life to consume us, our vision becomes very narrow. And God is inviting us to expand that vision, to see something much more beyond ourselves. So this weekend is Thanksgiving. It's an opportunity for you and I to do just this, to look around us and to give God thanks for the abundance that surrounds us. And to find even in the very difficulties of life that there are signs of hope and love and to see those and to name them and to be grateful. Because the spirit of gratitude, the spirit of thanksgiving, ultimately does change the way we perceive the world. It allows us to imagine something more and to see possibility beyond our simple confines. In a few moments, we will celebrate the greatest act of thanksgiving, and that is the Eucharist. 
For those of you who don't know, the Greek word Eucharist simply means to give thanks. And as I've said before, when we celebrate Eucharist, what we do is we take all our cares, all our anxieties, everything that we have in this life, our treasure, our gifts, the grain that makes the bread, the grape that makes the wine, we take all that and we bring that up to this altar and we offer it unto the living God and say, Lord, transform this into your grace. I give you thanks for what you've done. In fact, pay attention to the Eucharistic prayer today. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the goodness and love you've shown to us in creation. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the goodness and love you've shown to us in creation. That prayer is leading us right back to Jesus and the lilies of the field. Open our eyes. Open our ears to see and hear the good things that God is doing among us and be grateful. This doesn't diminish the challenges that we have, but rather is an invitation for you and I to bring that up here, to place it on the altar as we do the bread and wine, and say, Lord, transform them by your grace. Amen.